I'm thinking about how um, when I work with uh, corporations and they want to have an innovative culture and we tell them, okay, you know, break things down. Um, failure isn't failure. It's an opportunity to learn. It's, um, you know, how to, how to, um, this is what I've learned, you know, in, in my time at Stanford, is it's all about how you ask the question. And depending upon the question, you will get different outcomes. And so certainly in our work, we try to, we, 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 we go to people and say, you got to flip the script. So instead of saying, how do we get, how do we stop something? How do we have less bad things happen in the world? I go, we don't want bad things to happen in the world. Hence the, the whole peace thing. But instead of saying, how can we get more positive things in the world? What is it that you actually want to see in the world? And how can we increase that? Because the, the creative space for that is much bigger than just saying, I want to stop things. Um, and, and so I, I'm just realizing that there's probably a lot that um, companies or nonprofits or any kind of organization that wants to increase their creative confidence and their innovative ability, they could probably learn from the entertainment industry. And I hadn't really connected those dots yet, just in terms of you talking about everyone has a role in their function. The cinematographer is a cinematographer. They're not an actor. The, you know, the dolly grip is the dolly grip. I mean, they have very they know what their role is and it's almost like a, a live action role playing game, you know, and we all, or it's, you know, we all know, you know, our, this is our avatar. This is what it is. This is what we do. But even within that defined role, which you have to do, there's still space to contribute outside of your role. So if you see something, if you notice something, if you connect a dot and you go, Oh, you know, I'm the dolly grip, but by the way, if the character was doing this instead of that, that and 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 having the creative confidence to be able to or the ego confidence to be able to take that input and then it's not threatening seems to be something quite remarkable. How do you how do you when you think about questions and and asking the right questions, is there a protocol or is there a process that you have for that? Yeah, well, I was fortunate um, to have attended a small, somewhat obscure liberal arts college called St. John's College. Um, they actually have a campus in Annapolis, Maryland, and a campus in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and one of the takeaways from that particular experience, which I could spend a lot of time talking about, but won't, um, was, <clears throat> you know, when you come out of high school and you walk into a college class, and in this case, they were all seminars, you're all concerned about what's the right answer. And, and after four years of being in these seminars, regardless of what the material was that we were reading, you realize the right answer is a lot less important than the right question. Because unless you ask the right question, you may never get to really what the right answer is. And so, if you think of it as, okay, we're gonna have a meeting to talk about this particular product or this particular process or this particular aspect of our business, instead of saying, well, I should come in with some answers, you think, no, what are the real questions that we're asking here? And I should come in with those questions because then that will open the conversation to possibly lead us to some really good answers rather than walking in and saying, I've got the answer and a guy across the table or a woman across the table says, no, no, I have the answer. Now it becomes about competing answers and then it becomes a turf war or a power play. And it's like, if you ask a question, nobody's going to fault you or challenge you for asking a question unless they say, no, no, I think there's another question. Oh, okay, great. But now we're not, we're not butting heads. We're, we're, you know, we're digging in the sandbox, as it were, and looking for what, what we need to find. If you want to take a corporate culture and make it more innovative, you obviously have to say, okay, we have to ask questions and be prepared to take risks. Because if it's just about protecting the downside, great, you can do that for so long. And then the company or the, or the product or the service that comes along that was willing to take a risk is going to leave you in the dust because they went, yeah, but what if we did this? 
And you were so busy protecting the downside of saying, well, I just don't want to lose what I have. So I don't really want to challenge anything or innovate because I'm, it might go wrong. Well, of course it might go wrong. But as you say, failure, you know, is, is, is just a, a step in the process towards success. It's not necessarily the end in itself. I, you know, there's, I know no successful person in Hollywood who says I've never failed at anything. We've all failed. I failed numerous times. You learn more from your failures in some ways than you do from your successes. But unless you're prepared to take some risks, you're not going to succeed at all. Because you just, if you produce things or write things or whatever that look like everything else, they're just utterly forgettable. And they're never going to be hits or succeed because it's like, oh, yeah, it's just another one of those. And everybody knows it, smells it you know, and goes, not interested. So clearly, it starts with saying, what are the questions we should be asking? And what are the risks that we're prepared to take? Because unless you're prepared to take risks, you're never going to change anything. What is the new story we should be telling? How does it incorporate the old story and change the old story into a new story? And they're all part and parcel of the same thing. So um, speaking of risks, um, Joe Hughes from Drexel, who I um, I have had the pleasure of working with intensely the last six months, uh, says that, you know, said to me, and it was a good reminder, he says, like, always bet on yourself. And when I think of the things that have been successful in my career, in my life, it's been those times when I bet on myself rather than going through the elaborate process of, I'm going to write, you know, a 40 page business plan and I'm going to do the, you know, the elaborate pitch deck and, and, you know, a year later, I'm still hoping and please, please, someone give me the funding to start something, but rather just starting, just doing the work. Um, in your, in your experience, what, when, when, what have been the contexts or the conditions where you've, where you've been able to find success? And how does that work for you? Well, fundamentally, sort of being a writer, and I think this has, you know, applications literally no matter what you do, almost. It comes from inside you. You know, you need to come up with an idea or an approach or an, you literally need to take something that's inside you and put it out there as an object, whether it's a script or you know, a book or whatever it is. And so, in effect, in the entertainment business, you're always betting on yourself, okay? Um, the confusion sometimes comes in that, you know, having been descended from hunter-gatherers, right? We think, what I want is out there, and I've got to go out and get it, track it down, kill it, skin it, throw it over my shoulder, bring it home, cook it, knead it, okay? So it's out there somewhere. Success, money, fame, fortune, they're out there. And I would say, yeah, I understand why you would see things that way, but in my experience, that is not the case. In my experience, you find those successes in yourself and then the phone rings or the door opens or the opportunity presents itself. And you go, well, but that doesn't seem to make any sense. Yes, it's a paradox, I understand. But remember, it was a paradox when you went to sell something because it had to be old and it had to be brand new all at the same time, right? So you go, yeah, well, here's another paradox for you, which is, which is you have the resources within yourself to really create whatever it is you want out in the world. And you go, well, how do I get from here to there? Okay, now that's a little more complicated. And, and I can't necessarily give you the physics of it, although I did write a book called The MacGyver Secret, which is just about that, which is to say, you have more answers inside of yourself than you may know, okay? But you don't necessarily have the technique for accessing those answers. So by the way, here's this book. It's very simple. There's three steps and you can... You can hear your deepest subconscious, smartest self give you the answers you're looking for if you want, okay? Because they're all in there. 
you just have to know how to mine them. So you, the mining that goes on is not out in the world. The mining is in yourself. And then, then the obvious steps, what you need to do now, what you need to do next, so forth and so on, they present themselves to you and you just follow those steps. So, so it's, there are lots of, I mean, MacGyver came about in one of the most bizarre ways. You know, I, I was told that this pilot concept had been sold. It wasn't called MacGyver at the time. It had another name. I think it was called Hourglass. And, and I was going to be hired to just execute this concept. And so I was hired. And I said, okay, so tell me what the concept is. Because it was, you know, top secret kind of thing. It's great. And they told me what the concept is. They said, by the way, this has never been done before. I went, wow, that sounds exciting. You know, wow, let's do something that's never been done before. So they, they brought me in, big room, executives, producers, whole nine yards. And they tell me the concept. And I ask a couple of questions. Well, do you want this? Is that, oh, no, no, it's got to be there. Okay. And what about that? No, no, no. And I sat there for a long, uncomfortable moment. And then I said, look, I got to tell you something. And they said, what? And I said, there's a reason this has never been done before. And they said, why not? And I said, because it's not going to work. And there was this terrible silence in the room. And I thought, okay, they'll, they're going to fire me now because nobody likes to be told their baby's ugly. Oh, look, what an ugly baby you just gave birth to. It's like nobody says that, right? Except maybe your mother-in-law, you know, but even then she probably says it to her husband on the way home after meeting the baby for the first time. But she doesn't say to the mother, oh, sweetheart, you just gave birth to a really ugly baby. It's like nobody says that. Okay. Here I was saying to them, guys, you got one ugly baby here. And they went, well, what are you talking about? So I tried to explain to them why this was not going to work in the way that they had imagined it would. It sounds great in the room, but none of those people were the people who had to actually get in there and make it work. And I went, here's where you're going to run into trouble. I said, I could write that as a pilot, but you're really hiring me to come up with a series that's going to last five or more years, right? So here are your choices. It's like... If you want to fire me, that's fine. I'm okay with that. You can find somebody else. And, and, um, and, or, you know, we got to go a different direction. So, and they ultimately came to me and said, well, we're not going to fire you. You got to fix this problem. And the solution to the problem turned out to be MacGyver. Okay, so they wanted a single lead action adventure hero. That's fine. Okay, but, but they wanted to do this kind of time locked thing, which I said, for a television show, it's not going to work. And they said, you have to fix it. And I ultimately, the fix was ultimately MacGyver. And so the show stopped being called Hourglass. It was called MacGyver. And so I had taken a situation, but I took the risk. Instead of sitting there and saying, great, love it, guys. You got it. I'm going to write that. Knowing full well that it was going to crash and burn at some point, I went, okay, here's the risk. This doesn't work. If you want me to come up with something better, I'm open to doing that. If you want to fire me, fire me. But I got to be honest with you. If I write this, I know right now it's not going to fly. I took the risk and they went, we'll fix it. So I fixed it. And the fix turned out to be MacGyver, which has obviously, you know, gone on to be this phenomenally successful series. It's a verb in the dictionary now, you know, it's like, who knew? I certainly didn't know, you know, I was just trying yeah. to solve the problem. But, right. but I was willing at that moment to say, I'll put my head on the chopping block if that's what it takes, but this isn't going to fly. So you tell me what you want to do next. Mm -hmm. And that's how it happens. So you say, okay, I've done that numerous times in my life and career where you go, I see where this is all going and something inside tells me this is not going to work. So I can go along to get along, you know, but at the end of the day, it's not going to succeed. And whether I get blamed for it or it doesn't matter, most things in Hollywood don't succeed, it's not going to succeed. So if you really want me to aim for success, this is how I think we have to go. So how do you, 
Um, so Hollywood this way, certainly um, technology ventures, you know, when I was in venture capital and, and this, the ratio still holds true that eight out of 10 things that you invest in fail. Um, so it's really like an eeny, meeny, miny, mo. We really don't know. Um, and then you get the me too's. It's like, ah, oh, you found, find the, just like in, in Hollywood, you find a formula in, in venture capital startups that work. You go like, oh, Uber, then it becomes the Uber of this, the Uber of that, right? Until you play that out. Um, so we really don't know what works. And so most of the time stuff doesn't work. Um, how do you, what kind of personal resilience or kind of headspace you need to be in to be able to, to say like, yeah, that didn't work and move on to the next thing that doesn't work. I guess again, uh, I think for uh, certainly when I'm working with young people and also with corporates, especially I've done a lot of work in Europe in the, over the last five, seven years uh, where it's a much more conservative culture because um, they are managing the downside. Also, there isn't as much work mobility or job mobility in Europe, as I say, like in Silicon Valley, the average tenure for a job is between 18 months and two years. So if someone is still there for, you know, three years later, it's like, whoa, you've had that position for a very long time. Um, so the, the upside of that is that um, ideas move very quickly in the Silicon Valley ecosystem from company to company to company, because you could say, wow, I just hired someone from who was there at Amazon and they were there for two years. So they've got the latest thinking from Amazon and then they come into, uh, you know, a Pinterest or YouTube or a, a Uber or whatever. And so there's this constant cross pollinization of practices and things that work. And, and then also I, they, they have their list of like, here's all the things that, you know, that didn't work at Amazon or that didn't work at Facebook. And, and so there's this collective intelligence that goes on in the Silicon Valley ecosystem that doesn't necessarily happen in other sectors because people stay in their position for 20 years, right? So they have this inward focus rather than an outward orientation. Um, so how 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 does how is failure more like fertilizer in Hollywood or in someone's career rather than being like oh like a, a black mark? Well, so Hollywood is a curious, you know, is sort of a curious creature. Um, and I'll give you a couple aspects to to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a business of failure, and by that I mean. If you know anything about baseball, if you're a, a batter in baseball, you get up to bat. If you manage to hit the ball and get on base like two times out of every 10, you're a 200 hitter, okay? 200 hitters get paid millions, if not tens of millions of dollars a year. But that means eight out of 10 times, you're out, okay? The same is true in Hollywood. Most of the things in Hollywood <clears throat> that they make fail. Okay, some of them manage to break even and an even smaller percentage of them actually become hits. Now you're mostly aware of the hits because you don't pay attention to all the things that one, for one reason or another just didn't work, they just failed. Okay, so the answer is there's a lot more failure in Hollywood than success. So you just have to understand that that's the nature of the beast. Um, so how do you then align yourself with that reality. And number one, I go back to, okay, pull from your inside rather than trying to imitate something that was successful because more often than not, if there's something genuine coming from inside of you, it will resonate with both executives and ultimately with audiences. To survive in a system in, in that, like that, I early on made a very clear distinction between this is what I do, this is who I am. So my self-worth is not dependent upon the last thing I did or what Hollywood thinks about me because they don't know, you know what they want from day to day, sometimes from hour to hour, okay? So why am I going to invest my self-worth in the hands of people who literally don't know what they want on any, at any given moment? Okay, I want to hit. Well, of course, everybody wants a hit. That's, you know, big deal. Now what? Right. So, so I went, you know what? I am going to divorce who I am as a person, who I am as my family, my friends, my community, whatever that is. Okay, my sense of self worth. 
this, what I do for Hollywood, this is my, this is what I do. And there will be times when I'll be hot and there'll be times when I'll be cold. And the same people who would not return my phone call one month or one year, the next year are calling me, how soon can we have lunch? Cause you're hot and I want to bank on you now. And you go, I'm the same person that you wouldn't talk to six months ago, but now you want to talk to me. When if, well, if it was in my interest, I'd say, fine, I'll talk to you now. Even though six months ago or a year ago, you wouldn't even return my phone calls. Why? Because it was, it was a risk for them to do it then. It's not a risk for them to do it now. But I don't change. I remain the same. And I have come up against a lot of people who've said to me, Lee, you've been in this business for like decades. I mean, really, it's been, I started in my 20s. I'm now in my 60s, okay? So 40 plus years in the entertainment business. And they've said to me, you seem just as enthusiastic and energetic, maybe even more so than you were in your 20s. And I go, yeah, that's because I don't give Hollywood the power to determine my self-worth. So it's still fun for me. And I know that there will be failures because most things fail. I get that. And I know that there'll be periods where I'll be hot. And I know that periods where I'll be cold. And when I'm cold, I go, fine, I'm cold. So I'll just focus on my own stuff now until such time as the wheel turns around again. And suddenly, oh, now I'm, as, you know, I'm the best thing since sliced bread. But making that distinction between my internal sense of self-worth and their sense of my worth at any given moment was absolutely crucial to my survival. Um, and consequently, you know, ties back in a little bit to that MacGyver secret, which is mm -hmm. what you want is inside you. It's mm -hmm. not about them. It's not about whether they love you today and hate you tomorrow, because that's inevitable. If you take risks, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fall, it's gonna be painful, you're gonna get up and do it again, okay? But as a result of those failures, Hollywood is one of the few businesses where you can actually fail upwards. By that I mean, I would do, I've made some humongous, very expensive, epic productions, and they died. I mean, like just ran into a wall, crumbled to a million pieces, shattered. But the next time somebody wanted to do a big, impressive production, they'd call me and I'd say, why are you calling me? The last one crumbled into a million pieces. Yeah, but you've done it before. And I'd rather do this with someone who's done it before than with someone who's never done it before. And that goes back to that track record. And I say, but I failed. Yeah, I know you failed. That's okay. Everybody fails in this business. I don't hold that against you because you've actually done it. You actually went out on the limb. You took the risk. You, not, you knew how to deal with a budget that size and a cast that size and all these other things. And so consequently, I'd rather hire you to do this production than someone who's never done it before. You go. Right. So like they've yeah. kind of invested in your education. It's exactly an education. And now right. you have a kind of street cred because you went, yeah, I crashed and burned, but I learned a lot from that experience and I've done it before. Mm -hmm. And there's a limited number of people who've done it before. So there are no shortage of people in Hollywood who have literally failed upward because they went, yeah, I know he failed the last three movies, but he's done this kind of movie or she's done this kind of project. And I just assume put my money on them than on someone who's never done it before. So let's talk a little bit about the creative process. Um, you know, so often, like I hate to write. I was telling this to my co-op students earlier today, you know, and they're engineers and when we, they're, they're all introverts and we, we had them do a lot of writing this summer. It's like, you have to write just a 700 word blog article, do some research, put this idea out there. And they did 42 articles over the last five, six weeks. It's like, boom, boom, boom. And so they got a lot of revs out. And I go, I'd rather poke my eyes out than write. <laughs> because I get this writer's block. I mean, I can talk and people go, oh, you're such a good talker. You should be a great writer. And I go like, but then I look at that blinking cursor, <laughs> the blank screen and I'm going like, I'm much better editing is someone, like if there's a starting crummy thing, I can make it better. But if I'm, it's like, oh, how do you, how do you get around those blocks? How do you, 
you know, and then, and, and, you know, you have this process, the MacGyver secret of, you know, like tapping to that, that, that inner part of yourself. How do you get, how do you enlist your subconscious mind to do the work for you? Right. So that is in fact, the very essence of what I call the MacGyver secret, which I was encouraged by other people to write because the people, I, I use this technique for myself. I thought it was unique to me. Uh, and other people, I would share it occasionally with people, and some of them tried it and went, this is not unique to you, buddy. You've actually stumbled on something really effective here. You, this could work for all kinds of problem solving. It's not just for creative writing. And so I was encouraged to sort of put it in a book form and put it out there. It's a skinny little book. Anyway, you can find it on Amazon. The point is, your subconscious, it turns out, is really the creative engine inside of you. Your conscious mind is not, okay? Now, we're not taught to use our subconscious to create, because in school, it's all about, we're going to stuff you with information. When we say go, you got to regurgitate that information. We call it a test, right? If you, do, if, you, if you put enough of that information right on the test, you get a good grade, you get to go on to the next nonsense, right? Got it. That's not really creative, though. We don't teach creativity in our schools. Maybe they say, oh, go paint something or play with blocks or, you know, that's their notion of creativity. It's like, that's not creativity. Basically, what I discovered was that, and I discovered this because, you know, when I was tasked in Hollywood with running a television series, producing enormous amount of creative material under unbelievably tight deadlines, I noticed that the best stuff came to me when I was either driving or taking a shower. Now, this is not uncommon. People say, oh, you know, I have great ideas in the shower. Why don't I have great ideas when I'm sitting in front of my computer? Well, the reason why is because when you're in driving or taking a shower, your conscious mind, that hamster wheel of thoughts that when you wake up in the morning starts and never doesn't stop until you finally, you know, run out of steam and fall asleep, right? If that part of your mind is occupied by something like driving or taking a shower, where you kind of have to pay attention to what you're doing moment to moment, it allows your subconscious, which is really the creative engine, to kick up these ideas for you. So I, with the MacGyver secret, I ultimately, came up with a very simple method for saying, great, how can I get to this whenever I want that doesn't involve me getting in a car or having to take a shower because that got a little inconvenient, you know? And the answer was, you ask yourself a question and you write this question down. Whatever it is, it's like, okay, what's wrong with this product? Or what's a new product that no one's thought of? Or whatever the question is. Or, you know, what's the story that I want to tell? Doesn't matter. And then instead of standing there and racking your brain to answer that, you task your subconscious with that. And then you go do something else and you don't think about it. I mean, you go do, you exercise, there's what, what we call them incubation activities, okay? But that's what it is. You're allowing that idea, that question to incubate in this deeper, much smarter part of yourself. And you keep that conscious mind busy with something else driving, showering, gardening, cooking, exercising, practicing a musical instrument. There's literally hundreds of incubation activities. There's only four or five that don't work for incubation. They're in the book. I'm not going to bore you with them, okay? And then after a set amount of time, you come back and you look at your question and you say to your subconscious, okay, I've let you incubate on this. What do you have for me? And then you simply start writing in longhand. It absolutely makes no difference what you write. You can write the Star Spangled Banner. You can write what you want to have for lunch. You can write, you know, uh, oh, I was off running and I saw this person and it, it doesn't matter what you write. You simply start writing. And within 30, maybe 60 seconds of just writing, you can even write gibberish. It really makes no difference. Those answers will start to flow out of you right through the tip of your pen because your subconscious is trying to communicate with you all the time. You're just too busy with all those dumb thoughts to hear it, okay? And so it will answer your questions and you just keep writing until you go, wow, 
Where did that come from? Wow, what a great idea. I never thought of that. I did. Boom, it just pours out of you. Sometimes you get questions back. It's like, well, are, do you want this or do you want that? Oh, that's a good question, you know? And you just keep turning those questions back and forth to yourself, in essence, creating an ongoing dialogue with your subconscious. And the answers you're looking for will, will appear to you. I know it sounds voodoo-y and magic-y, but, but that's the way our minds work. And that works a little differently for every person. Some people it's better to do in the morning. Some people it's better to do in the evening. Some people it's like you can actually incubate while you sleep. So your problems can be solved while you're sleeping. I know it sounds like something, you know, on an infomercial. But the truth is your subconscious is always trying to help you deal with the problems you just haven't necessarily found a way to communicate with it directly. And that's essentially what I learned how to do. And the upside was not only were my ideas always better that way, but all the stress of creating was gone. No writer's block. Why? Because when tasked with the problem, I went, I don't have to come up with the answer. My sub, the elves in the back room there are going to come up with the answer. Okay. Because they seem to come up with great answers all the time. So, so in this process, you write down the question, like in terms of the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you can do it on a computer, but the neuroscience, because I, <clears throat> the book was actually co-authored with a, um, a fairly prominent uh, a PhD in psychology and cognitive science named Colleen Seifert. And, and she wrote all the science blocks in the MacGyver secret book. So we would say, look, here's a story about my using this, somebody else using this. Here's a piece of instruction about how this works. And then she would, here's, and she would say, here's the science for why this guy is not full of bullcrap, okay? And, but the answer is, you write down the question, it's better in longhand. You can do it on a computer, but the science says that when you write in longhand, somehow it goes deeper into the neural pathways of your brain. I'm not a neuroscientist, I can't explain why. It just does. So you write the question down in longhand. You can, it can be one line, it can be three pages. You write it down in as many different ways as you can. Task your subconscious with it, put it down, go do something else and don't think about it, okay? Give yourself a set amount of time, could be an hour, could be four hours, could be a day, whatever you choose. And then you come back, you look at the question again, and then you simply start the act of writing and say, what do you got? Write anything and then see what comes up. It's really that simple. It's crazy simple, you know? So I, it's funny because uh, since we've been talking about it, um, I have my, my little notebook. And when I wake up in the morning, I just do the stream of consciousness writing. And I tell myself, I'm just going to write for five pages. And they're small pages. And it is. It's in, it's in longhand. Um, with the, my with my spe special fountain pen that was gifted to me, so that way I could find my voice, and um, I just write. And sometimes it's sort of like my sleep was meh, or you know it's hot today, or I mean it's is it like you say it's gibberish, it's a star spangled banner, it's nothing. It's like apropos of nothing. I have nothing to say, and then I just keep on writing. I go, but I'm just gonna write whatever, and it's not so much the conscious, but just letting my hand write. And I've gotten a lot of insights from it and kind of these ahas that I couldn't have done if I were just sitting there going like, I'm just going to think hard about this. Right. And, and that's been a lovely practice to have during this pandemic. And that's exactly um, it. You're, at a certain point, your conscious mind gets tired or bored because it doesn't know what else to write. And your subconscious mind says, finally, here, <laughs> what about this, Margarita? <laughs> hey, Margarita, you, what about this? You know, did, did right. this ever occur to you, sweetheart? You know, it's just like, it's like, wow, where was all this coming from? And the answer is, it's coming from inside you. It was there all along. But that conscious mind actually did more to obstruct it than mm -hmm. it did to you know, to encourage it. I know it it's sounds almost, accurate, but another one of those paradoxes, so. Yeah, um, and I wanted to ask you about MacGyver. I know that when, uh, like, I think it was last year, I'm, I'm losing track of time, it's COVID time. So in the before times, whenever that was, I'm not, it could have been, I'm trying to think, 2018, 2019, early in 2019, I know um, you were, uh, you've been part of this peace engineering consortium and we bring you in as the 
the narrative storyteller creative avatar in the group and talking about MacGyver as, you know, he's kind of like, we were thinking about how do we tell the story of peace engineering? And you wrote something for us about in some way through the lens of MacGyver, how he's like the original peace engineer. And one of the, well, you know, it, MacGyver's shown in like 79 countries. It's still viewed and um, there are a lot of different levels in terms of that character. But one of them certainly in terms of the plot is that he never uses weapons. And he's in these conflict situations and yet he doesn't fight conflict with conflict and um if you could say something about macgyver in terms of the the ethos of macgyver the character and how he operates in the world and why you chose to um give him those characteristics sure um so so again it goes back to asking the question Okay, here's this action adventure hero. Okay, now you look at the history of action adventure heroes. So say, okay, James Bond, beginning of the movie, he meets Q and he gets the pen that's a bomb or, you know, the camera that's a, a gun or whatever, you know, he gets all these toys, right? Uh, and Indiana Jones, he had the hat and the gun and the whip. And it when I was trying to create MacGyver, which ended up being with a group of my writer friends, we said, well, what if this guy has absolutely nothing? What if he's a secret agent and he has to go into a situation, he's got nothing. No, no fancy toys, no gun, no whip. And I went, no gun. So what would it look like if an action adventure hero couldn't use a gun? And mm -hmm. I thought, well, then he would have to, by definition, come up with another way to solve the problem. Now, I didn't do this for moral reasons. I did it for purely dramatic reasons. Mm -hmm. Every other action adventure hero in the universe that we know of pretty much uses a gun. They said, well, mm -hmm. let's take that gun away. What happened? Well, then he's going to have to figure out another way to solve the problem. Hey, there's your hook every week because people are going to tune in and say, what's he going to come up with this week? Because he doesn't shoot back. It's like, yep. So now you say, oh, this becomes a nice little hook. Okay, who knew that this hook was going to resonate with, you know, so many people in so many countries because taking away the gun meant he's going to have to innovate. Oh, and by the way, he's going to have to innovate with whatever is around him in that moment, in that situation, because he's not coming in with a bag full of tricks. In fact, he comes in with a bag and he picks things up along the way that he thinks might prove useful down the line. And you're sitting there going, well, what's he going to use that for? What's he going to use that for? And now we have that nice gamify you know mm. experience of oh he picked up that and he picked up that and he picked up that what is he going to do with any of that stuff and then of course when he uses some of it or all of it you go oh wow i, ne I didn't see that coming great okay so this sense of again i don't need to have opposite and overwhelming force what i need to have is the ability to look at my situation and turn whatever I have into whatever I need, okay? Mm -hmm. But that resource really comes from inside of you, which says it's okay to figure out how to turn whatever I have into whatever I need. And the other thing that he always seemed to have as a character was a sense of humor and humility, okay? Mm -hmm. So he was always the smartest guy in the room. He never acted like the smartest guy in the room. You know, James Bond, shaken, not stirred. It's like, get over yourself, buddy. It's a martini. Who cares, you know? Right. Let's, you know, but MacGyver was like the guy next door. He just happened to know chemistry and physics and biology and whatever it was, okay? And he went, oh, you know, if I take uh, this cleaner and I take some of this talcum powder and I find some of these iron filings, I can make a smoke bomb, we'll throw it out there, they'll be blinded and we can get away. You know, and it's mm -hmm. like, wow, you know? So the resources were inside of him and he used the resources that happened to be around him. And because he maintained a sense of humor and humility, turns out that an open and laughing mind is much more likely to come up with a good solution than a frightened, 
resentful or angry mind where you're in a fury state or a panic state and you can't think of anything. Like when you say, oh God, I have to write something. <gasps> Boom, the panic door slams shut and you're frozen like a deer in the headlights, okay? So it turns out that those attributes, I think, happen to be great management tools for this century. One, avoid conflict. Why? Because conflict is probably just gonna to lead to more conflict as we have unfortunately witnessed in Afghanistan and in Iraq and, and in all the other adventures, you know, we as a country have wanted to engage in around the world. It's like, we think we're just gonna get in and, and hit hard and then get out. And it turns out not to be that simple, okay? And by the way, with the problems that are facing the planet, the pandemic being a new and obvious one, even if you win the conflict, the house is still on fire, you know? Okay, so avoid conflict. MacGyver core value number one. Number two, how do you turn what you have into what you need? Because we're all gonna have to do that in one way or another. It's nice to think we as a country have all the resources we'll ever need. We can tell the rest of the world to go to hell, we'll be just fine. There is no such country like that in the world anymore. It just doesn't exist. We are an interdependent, you know, civilization, which is obvious because a disease breaks out in China and before we know it, it's everywhere in the world, okay? It could just as easily have started in San Francisco. You know, these things were pressing the boundaries of humanity into the corners of the world and the world is pushing back. Surprise, surprise, okay? So, how do you t avoid conflict? How do you turn what you have into what you need? And then try and maintain sense of humor and humility because you're much more likely to come up with a good solution and be able to cooperate with somebody on that solution than if you say, I hate you, you hate me, let's just go to war, we're right back in conflict, the problem doesn't get solved, okay? Mm -hmm. So, great, we may not agree on everything, but can we fix this thing together because we both need more food. We both need fresh water. We both need more energy. So do you think that conflict is in some ways the result of asking the wrong question? I would say... Or framing, framing the situation, you know, because conflict can come from a, a place of scarcity, of zero sum of like you have it and I need it so I'm going to take it from you rather than saying how do I transform or maybe that I actually have the ability to get what I need you know it's sort of like an interesting thing about MacGyver as you say it's not like he's walking around with a bunch of gear but he's able to to transform it when he needs it so there's a certain amount of security in that character he's not hoarding he's not saying like oh my god you know where am I going to get my next whatever there's this like walking through the world confident that he'll be able to transform what he needs when he needs it and when he doesn't need it he can go back to being whatever it was right so so again we're, we're looking at sort of the two things most conflicts are derived from fear okay mm -hmm. And you say, well, I'm afraid that if I don't do this, they're gonna do that, and then I will be denied resources, I will lose my territory, I will, whatever it is. All conflict fundamentally starts with a fear. So first you have to do is say, well, what's the fear? How realistic is the fear? And then you step to the other side of the line and you say, okay, I acknowledge that fear, but what's the opportunity? What if we said, hey, Suppose we both agree we're not going to throw nuclear missiles at each other, but we will work together on resolving, coming up with new energy resources that will be good for both of us, okay? Well, we acknowledge the fear. Here's the fear. So let's see if there's some way we can limit that fear, right, and explore that opportunity. And any conflict at the end of the day, as far as I can tell, starts with, if the fear overcomes the opportunity, you're in conflict. If the opportunity overcomes the fear, you're in cooperation. It's not that complicated. I mean, I understand that the world is a very complicated place. We humans love to complicate everything, okay? But at the end of the day, 
we pretty much all want the same thing, which is to have enough of whatever we need and to live in peace that no one's going to come and try and take it away from us. It's like, it's not that complicated. Oh, and by the way, never before in the history of the world have we had the means to do that for so many people. Okay, now if you say, yeah, but I want to have a thousand to a million times more than anybody else. Oh, okay, well, that's coming from a fear that I have to have more than anybody else if I'm going to feel good about myself or if I'm going to feel powerful. And now you start getting those imbalances and you say, well, wait a minute, you have billions of dollars, but these people have nothing to eat. Okay, so this is going to create an imbalance and they're afraid of starving and you're afraid they're going to take your billions away from you. So guess what? You got a conflict brewing there. Instead of saying, you know what? I've got billions of dollars. I can only live in so many houses. I can only eat so much food. I can only wear so many shirts. Okay, so maybe I should look at this as an opportunity as Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and all those other guys who or the Billionaires Boys Club or whatever they're called, you know, where they say we're going to give away most of our money to charity in some form, in some way, because that's really the opportunity here. Mm -hmm. How do we fix the problems of the world with this enormous wealth rather than simply hoarding it? Because it's not doing me any good. It's just sitting in a, you know, literally it's, it's ones and zeros in a computer somewhere, okay? Nobody has a billion dollars of cash sitting around. It's just too cumbersome, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, what can be done with this, um, you know, enormous wealth that I've amassed? There are opportunities here. Can I apply this wealth to those opportunities and get rid of malaria and get rid of this disease or that disease or whatever it is? And so... Mm -hmm. You look and say, what's the fear? What's the opportunity? Which way do I want to move? Great. So this has been wonderful, Lee. So I want to ask you three things in closing. So what are the three things that you want people to take away from our conversation in terms of uh, a new idea, um, something that they can learn, something that they can apply? Three things. Yeah. One question, three things. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first, the first, the first thing, and, and in some ways the most important thing is, all of us have more resources within us than we ever dreamed possible. And so really the challenge becomes, how can you find a way to tap into your own resources? We know that we all want things from the world. I need a new place to live. I, I'm not, I, I don't have enough food. I get it, okay? Those are serious and, and important issues, but we all have the capacity to create what we need from within us if we stop and look at it. MacGyver's Secret, no MacGyver's Secret, I don't care. I sold lots of books. It doesn't matter to me. You buy the book, you don't buy the book. You can go on the website. It'll give you pretty much everything you need to know for free anyway. So, okay, that's number one. Number two, the notion of prejudice is incredibly bizarre to me because nobody chooses their own birth. Nobody says, I want to be born white, I want to be born black, I want to be born Asian, I want to be born Muslim. Nobody makes those choices. Those choices are made for you, and you wake up one day and go, well, here's where I am. How can you possibly hate somebody for something over which they had absolutely no control? It just doesn't make any sense to me. I understand that there's prejudice and there's hate and, and we are watching all of this once again rise to the surface because of this pandemic, which is putting pressure on some people more than other people. And it's bringing forth the inequalities of things. Totally get it. But at the end of the day, what is the basis of prejudice? It's fear. And instead of saying, wait a minute, what am I afraid of? Why don't you step to the other side and say, what's the opportunity here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is, I know the world is a scary place now. It's okay to be scared. But the real meaning of courage is not the absence of fear. The real meaning of courage is being afraid and doing what you need to do anyway. So whether that's in business or in life or in relationships, you have the means, okay? You have the strength have the courage. We can solve all these problems because guess what? We created all these problems. 
So if we created all these problems, it stands to reason that we have the ability collectively, individually, across the world to solve these problems. What we got to do is get our head in that game instead of the blame game or the hate game or the me game, okay? It's about what is the opportunity versus what is the fear? There you go, Margarita, that's it. Thank you, Lee. This has been a pleasure. Um, we will have the link to the MacGyver secret in the show notes. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Santa Fe sometime soon. Great. Take okay, care. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.